Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. So I asked somebody what I should talk about tonight, and they said adventure, <laughs> which is a great topic. And it reminded me of when I was much, much younger. I read an autobiography of a Canadian Swami, a woman, whose I think her name is Swami Shivananda Radha. And she's not alive anymore, but anyway... When she was in her mid-40s, I think she was 46 years old, she started having dreams. She was living in Canada. She started having dreams about Swami Shivananda from Rishikesh. You may have seen pictures of him or know who he is. He is uh, the founder of the Divine Life Society in India, and he uh, gave rise to, his activity gave rise to many other teachers many other lineages like Integral Yoga and a bunch of other ones. So anyway, he's a very well-known teacher. And so she started having these dreams. Swami Radha, as she's called, they still have their <laughs> their center up in Canada somewhere. And she's a successor, who I think, whose name is also Swami Radha. She went to India to meet Swami Shivananda, and he confirmed her dreams and she only spent six months with him. And then he told her, as he really did quite often, he didn't like to keep people around too long. He would often say, okay, now go, go do something. You know, <laughs> go spread the teachings, he would say to people who had only been around for six months. Anyway, so she went back to Canada and founded a tantric teaching lineage in the, in the sort of synthetic, somewhat watered-down style of the Shivananda lineage. And she wrote a book about her six months with Swami Shivananda. And it's a really wonderful book about meeting Guru and of devotion to Guru and kind of having your life blown apart. And she says on the very first page something that always impressed me. She said, having a Guru is a great adventure. Having a great Guru is the greatest adventure any human being could possibly have. And when I read that, I knew instantly that it was true. What's so adventurous about it? Well, first of all, you never really know what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> when we have regular spiritual teachers, or we're, you know, we go to a Buddhist meditation center, or we have, go to a yoga studio, we pretty much know what we've signed up for. <laughs> I mean, there's variations, but... It's not shocking. <laughs> when we're working with somebody who's more awake, then there's, a, there's this great element of surprise and destabilization and even uh, an adventurous kind of feeling overwhelmed. There's also elements of shock. <laughs> and all of these things, if you are someone who is fated to work with a teacher like that are going to be really fun for you. So even though they're hard, you're going to find them to be really fun. That feeling of not knowing what's happening next and being destabilized and being confronted with things and the experience of shock that happens in various ways around people that have some realization. So, yeah. You know, in American culture, well, American spiritual culture, it's gotten to the point, there's kind of a parallel here, you know, with women's orgasms. I'm going to say one of these. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
from Victorian times until somewhat recently, a lot of people didn't even know that women had orgasms. And then when 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 people found out, aka men, then then we had to have, <laughs> you know then we had to have one. Right? <laughs> well, it's the same thing with gurus. Um, people in the US <laughs> didn't know that gurus what they were or that they even existed in large part. But once people found out that gurus were around, then they had to have one. <laughs> so a guru has become sort of an acquisition um, in certain circles, right? <laughs> something that you have to achieve, capture, get, something on the, your spiritual career ladder that is something you have to obtain. So, the, But the point is that very few people are actually suited for working at the level that Swami Radha was working at with her group. Very few people like the feeling of being destabilized, confronted, shocked, <laughs> never knowing what's going to happen next. Very few people like that. But the ones that do, love it. <laughs> so the adventure is really uh, that, but also what you discover about reality in yourself. Right? The freshness of it. The uncontrived, spontaneous quality of life is an adventure in and of itself. And when you do spiritual practice over a long period of time, the staleness and repetitiveness and contrived quality of your life begins to fall away, begins to erode, and then everyday life becomes somewhat of an adventure. Everyday life begins to take on some of that quality of, I don't know what's going to happen next, and some of that quality of, oh, I just, I'm really looking forward to whatever happens, even though I have no idea what, it, what it's going to be. So, Guru is really, as I like to say, just an instrument or an appliance. And the point is that that quality of surprise that Guru brings into your life, that quality of adventure, is something you eventually want to have everywhere in your life, not just around your teacher. That would be dumb if you had to rely on one particular person to experience that. We often talk about what a slog spiritual practice is. <laughs> People often say how difficult it is, how boring it is, what a slog it is, how excruciating it is, because we have to learn all this stuff about ourselves. But actually, underlying all that is this sense of incredible adventure that is really better than uh, any other adventure, I think, better than any adventure that a human being could undertake. It will exceed every expectation you have. You know, your expectations can only hold you back because any expectation you do have is way more limited than what is actually available to you. And that's also just the mind-blowing part of it. Anything you think spiritual practice is about or think it can bring you, and those of you that have been around for a while, you know, you can think back to what you thought it was going to be or how you thought it was going to be. And for at least some of you, that is going to be pale in comparison to what it actually is. <laughs> so, I'll stop there. And this is Satsang. You can talk about what I just talked about or ask or talk about really anything else whatsoever. Do you have any um, tips for uh, just ways to more and more practice without expectation? Mm -hmm. I, I have seven tips. Great. But I'll, only, <laughs> I'll only give them to you if you fill out this pop-up form with your name and an email address. <laughs> so... Tips for... Sorry, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> for dropping expectation while on the cushion, doing seated practice. Well, you have to do something direct. So if you talk yourself into dropping expectations, then the expectation chatter will just be replaced with the dropping expectation chatter. <laughs> and that doesn't, that's just like a horizontal move. That doesn't really get you very far. So I like to use visual aids 
And the ones that I have used are my own personal ones that just occurred to me while I was sitting there. So I don't know if they'll work for anybody else, but you could try it and see how it is, right? So one of them is, and this actually I think is my most powerful one, is um, I visualize them. You don't even have to have your eyes closed. You can just think of this, but you could close your eyes and visualize it too. I visualize myself, and then I visualize Ma, my guru, over there, maybe like 15 feet away, 10 or 15 feet away. And then I think of myself getting up out of this body, like making a second body, and moving to the center between me and Ma. And then this, the body that I leave behind is all of my expectations and fixations. Mm. And then I just go sit in the middle, and it, for at least some time, there's nothing there but that experience. There's nothing else there. And then I try to do my practice in that condition. Another little simple thing I've tried is... And this isn't just about expectations. It's like anything you're trying to get a break from for at least a moment. I I think of that thing that I'm trying to get a break from and experience something more naked and open as like a sweater that I have around my shoulders. And I just... And then I just sit there experiencing not having that thing. So these things don't work permanently. They're ways of tasting uh, less... A karmically tense uh, um, experience, and then, but but it, it is all about tasting. It's about getting that taste in there, even if it only lasts for a minute. It's fine, and you can try and do it like several more times and see what that feels like. Cool, thanks. Mm-hmm. But these are all things that just arrived in my, you know, for me to just try out. So. You should be, feel free, you know, something comes to you to try that out. But this idea that you sort of like step out of your karmas in some way for a moment. Um, And the reason, the sitting between thing is actually somebody's practice. I don't know where I learned about that. But the sitting between is so that there's, it's like a space of non-attachment. You're not going to your teacher. You're not being your old self. So there's like you're in between any possible thing you could be attached to. Do you understand? Because, of course, we're all very attached to our teachers, too. And me included. Very, very attached. (laughs) So, you know, sitting between where there's in the zone of non-attachment to anything is a very good experience. Cool. Thanks. Um, I was wondering when you do, like, puja and you offer the water and a flower... What do you do with it when you offer it, when you replace it? When you're done? Oh. Yeah. So once you have offered that, um, anything that's not something you are going to consume, mm-hmm. you know, actually, here's a, a great story. When I was, um, I don't even know how old I was, but I met this wacky family when I was in high school. I can't even begin to tell you how wacky they were. They were like a modern-day Adams family. (laughs) And I like wacky things, so I liked hanging out with them. They were just so weird. Uh, Just to give you an idea, one time I came home, and the older son, he cut trees for a little, he trimmed trees, and they had this hideous vinyl black couch in some kind of TV room. They were some sort of, like, deposed old English family. They had all these, like, old portraits of... English royalty that they were related to hanging up over this TV with this vinyl couch. And this guy who just got home from work was sitting on the couch with a raw slab of beef on the black vinyl. And he was just like picking it up, biting it, slapping it back down on the vinyl. This was like typical for this family. (laughs) (laughs) Just So there was something I was going to tell you about them related to this question. I don't know, I don't know how this relates to it. It does. <laughs> <laughs> something about puja water and flowers and removing offerings. If you're not going to eat it. If you're, you're not going to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For the life of me, I don't know what that is. <laughs> there was a story I wanted to tell you. <laughs> There's so many stories about them I could tell. <laughs> anyway, they're Christmas tree. No, some other day I'll tell you that story. <laughs> uh, it's called Nirmalium, so anything you don't eat, 
uh, like cookies or oh yeah, that was a story. <laughs> so they had at one point they had they had a boarder who was whatever that lineage is where they go Namyo Ringyo oh, yeah. whatever that Nichiren. is. Nichiren. Huh? Nichiren. Nichiren. Yeah. So he had an altar and he offered food to it and he was very poor. So he offered ring dings to this altar every day. Oh. That was what he could afford. <laughs> and then he would eat the ring dings afterwards. <laughs> anyway, so whatever you don't eat, or all the water and flower petals, and anything that's not consumed, is called nirmalium once the puja is over. And it's food that's it's prasad still, even though you aren't going to eat it. Other realm beings or other animals can benefit from that. So what you want to do is within 24 hours of doing the puja, you take it outside and you put it under a tree or just somewhere on the ground where people aren't going to step on it and make that as an offering to other beings. Long answer to a simple question. <laughs> and, you know, you could offer rain dings if you even still sell them. It's kind of a related question. So we found a, a, it's a mouse in a leech's room that's eating, that ate the prasad. Oh. Um, so now it's eating all the rice out of what, what's the practical thing to do about this mouse? Catch it in a live trap and set it, take it outside. Yeah, that's what we have. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when I used to teach at the Tibet Center in Portland, I've told you guys this, mm-hmm. I, I was teaching in between the church seats in this like giant altar with this giant gold Buddha. And they always had offerings left on the altar. Many, many, many offerings. And as I was teaching, there would be literally rats, not just mice. Oh. Rats running across the altar eating all the offerings. <laughs> <laughs> Did they try to catch those rats? I, I, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of prasad, those rats. I have a question. This actually led to your question. Um, okay, so I found a mouse in my house. It was in my compost. And it was this whole inner turmoil. The mouse came back after I bought it outside and let it free. And then the second time it came back, we dumped our coffee grounds and like leftover like wet things in there. It's compost. It's compost. And so the mouse was half drowned at that point. Mm. And so I brought it outside again, but it was still living. So I brought it outside again, and I wrapped it in a little blanket and like left some crackers for it outside. <laughs> and um, and then when I came back the next morning, it had passed away. And so, and then I had to like go do something that day. And I left for the day and I came back and there's ants eating it outside. Everything is food. Everything is food. But I didn't want to let it, I, I felt like I wanted to honor its life. Mm-hmm. And so instead I wanted to bury it. And, I, and then I started thinking about that exact question of, should I have left it for the ants? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the Hindu worldview and actually in science, everything is food. Everything is being consumed by something, and everything is consuming something. That's the way of the world, right? So the best thing to do in that case is say a prayer for the mouse, and uh, specifically a prayer for the mouse's liberation. So you pray, I hope this mouse is born in a form that it can do spiritual practice next time. I hope this mouse, I ask that this mouse meet teachers. I ask that this mouse be given teachings. I ask that this mouse be able to realize. That's the kind of prayer I always do. Uh, like, you know, if I hit something or I go by a traffic accident and there's some horrible thing happening. Um, pray for people or animals' liberation. If you know mantra, you can do mantra. Uh, I don't know, you know what your familiarity with these kinds of things is, but there's a mantra called the Mahamritan Jaya Mantra, which you can also just do on the fly. Like, if you see some accident or something dying or dead... You can just like instantly do, you know, nine Mahamrit and Jaya mantras for that being or person. Um, that's a good thing too. But you can always say a prayer. And it's good to feed the ants. <laughs> <laughs> can we talk more about um, that the animal life and human consumption of animals and your view and your view on that? Mm-hmm. It's definitely a long-standing moral dilemma that I'm mm-hmm. always engaged in. Well, the view in general of this tradition is the same as the view that Ayurveda has, which is for whom and when. So there isn't one, one moralistic rule. 
everything, everything about this tradition is functional. So this tradition has no morality. It doesn't even particularly have ethics in the sense of like relative ethics because you know the experience is that the the fu- fundament of reality is goodness, right? And if you can realize that in yourself, everything that you do will be of benefit. So you don't really need like an exoskeleton of ethics. We follow precepts. We follow sort of some ground rules just to make us not get into too much trouble until we realize. But there's not a, there's not like a sense of any moral or ethical condemnation of anything or any paradigm that says this is good for all time and this is bad for all time. We're always looking, always, and this is very hard for us in our condition right now, we're always looking at the specifics of a circumstance and asking about the specifics of a circumstance and how can we respond skillfully to that circumstance. So in, in Ayurveda, meat is considered to be medicine. And there's some people who are just not going to be optimally healthy unless they eat some meat. And there's a lot more to it than that. I'm, you know, I'm saying these things very simply. But there is no, um, there's no adherence to the idea that a vegetarian diet is better. What's best is whatever is best for you, basically. Now, that being said, you know, we don't want to be eating tortured animals or torturing animals because that creates uh, impediments for us in, in our practice, right, in life. So it's better to, if you can afford it, if you're going to eat meat, it's better to buy meat from animals that were well treated, if you possibly can. I just don't know if that exists to my specifications. Mm-hmm. So while I do believe that there are qualities that are medicinal, and there are times where I've thought that probably I need that quality, there's still this moral dilemma that's like, there is no, because it's still been, it's still something that, why is my health more important than an animal's life? Mm-hmm. And so I just, I've been learning about Ayurveda and thinking mm-hmm. about that more and more, and so I used to be like really hardcore, no way I'm ever eating meat, mm-hmm. vegan for a while, and vegetarian, and now I'm eating fish and whatever. But the point is, my mind is constantly um, considering the value in different foods, mm-hmm. especially right now, but I still can't get over the hump of, is there ever an mm-hmm. okay way? Well, just put it, try to just for a minute be me. Because how I approach this is not about not about morals. It's just I feel sad about how animals are being treated. Mm-hmm. Right. I just go with that. I feel sad about it. Mm-hmm. I feel grief about how beings are treated, not just anim- not just the animals we eat, but all beings. Right. So with that, I just try to do my best not to participate in the suffering of other beings. But I'm not going to be able to completely divorce myself from systems that create harm. You know, it's not really possible to be alive and completely step out of all systems that create harm. So you just have to do your best. And if for you that means being a vegetarian, that's fine. I was a vegetarian for a number of years, cause, not because I thought it was wrong to eat animals. Like, it was just because I felt sad. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just very like plain. Uh, and then uh, twice my teacher came in dreams and said, told me that I had to eat meat. She said, you're not healthy enough to be a vegetarian. I've, I've had not, so. not a dream teacher, but, you know, <laughs> similar, not, not that, but reasons where I'm mm-hmm. thinking about it more. And it's, it's just really hard yeah. for me, so I just wanted to hear more. Yeah, the other thing is, you know, there, in all of the direct realization traditions, there's no dogma or prescription about vegetarianism. And all of the, uh, but there's also not any like wanton eating of meat either. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's practical. So, you know, all of my teachers ate meat, pretty much. Uh, maybe there was one that didn't, but most of them did. I mean, even the Dalai Lama eats meat because his doctors told him to, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't want to, but his doctors told him he had to. 
So uh, I think everybody has to make their own decision and just do what makes you feel most relaxed. One thing I have heard from Tibetan teachers is that if you have some realization, you might, and you eat an animal, that might give that animal more cause for liberation. I don't know if I buy that or not. <laughs> I don't have any personal experience of that, so I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really, I've never found it possible to believe in things. I have to actually know for myself that that's what's said. <laughs> You could always raise your own animals. Love them and kill them. (laughs) (laughs) That might be harder, right? Right. And if that's harder, then doesn't that mean the answer is no? Well. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.